I'm Neoma Finn. Tonight I have a special co-host in the studio. You all know him as Cameron Buckner, the host of Dixie Cryptid and What If It's True. And tonight Cam has has, uh, agreed to help me with uh, this interview and be my Ed McMahon. Normally I'm Ed and he's Johnny Carson, but tonight (laughs) we reversed roles. So uh, thank you for doing this for me, Cam. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm just going to sit over here in my little corner and let you ladies talk. If something pops in my head, I'll ask a question. Uh, well, we're pretty good at that, so that works out. Go for it. <laughs> and our guest tonight is Miss Dana Holyfield, and I'm sure everybody knows her name. She is quite famous. She is an author, a bang-up cook. She has her own YouTube studio, and she's done a documentary that's available on Amazon. And... um. So, um, how are you doing tonight, Dana? I'm doing great. (laughs) Good. How are you? I'm just doing fantastic. Um, So, so let's begin with, uh, I know that everybody knows you with the Honey Island Swamp Monster, but I bet a lot of people don't know that you started out years ago that you went to Hollywood to pursue a career in acting and modeling and screenwriting. And I find that really fascinating. You want to tell us about that? Uh, Well, yeah, I one day just, well, I knew from a young age I wanted to write and, you know, I was always interested in modeling and acting and, and I had the opportunity. I was working as a stand-in in New Orleans for Kelly McGillis. And then from there, I just decided with some people that were moving, they're like, you want to go to California? And I'm like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so hopped on a plane and I stayed there like eight years. Oh, um, that is cool. I, pers- I was... I did modeling and some acting, and I, you know, ended up making a movie I co-wrote at, right before I moved back here. It was a little small production, but I learned a lot about. Um, well, tell us about it. It was a, f- a film called Infidelity. <laughs> yeah, it was a, the director was at the time I was in a relationship with him, and he was the director, and I was. I had many roles. I was like co-producer, co-writer. I did like, you know, (laughs) sets and helped out. We learned everything, you know, doing everything. So it was quite an experience. Um, Learn how hard it is to try to do something like that. But we managed to get through it and and made it. And the fun part was like going into the studio and watching the dailies and watching it come together. Um, Went to Canada to do sound and, so it was fun. It was a good experience, and <clears throat> and I always pers- you know wanted to write. S- screenwriting was my passion, and so I still write. I've written many scripts that no one's ever read. <laughs> they just keep piling up. <laughs> it's like you know, one day maybe I'll get get them, get it to somebody that might could get it back on the screen and or do them, do them if, myself so it's, you know I also learned how to edit video and um, yeah you know, I made my documentary film I, I made that it was kind of like with a little uh, video camera the home video camera it was poor quality but I was running around with the swamp meet you know going to people I had heard had uh, sightings and encounters and I wanted to get their story and so the quality of the video was terrible <laughs> but i was you know knew, knew how to edit so i pieced all that together um using the vegas editing software and made my little documentary so i've, I've had a, you know a lot of critics saying that's poor quality and you know like well of course it was a little home video camera i didn't really <laughs> i didn't have the big production i didn't have a crew i just had me and my camera and whoever gave me a boat ride take me out in the swamp <laughs> it was usually my brother or you know a cousin or some fr- river friends and and if i see somebody that someone say oh they had a sighting or you know so i'd go talk to them and a lot of people were scared I, didn't want to talk to me they're like oh you know, i don't want to be made fun of and but um i managed to get a lot of good interviews you know uh, people to willing to talk about it and then there was a lot that wouldn't so one of the things I watched that documentary twice, by the way. Oh, you did. Where and can one you of the find things that documentary? It's on, on Amazon. Amazon. Video. On mm-hmm. Okay. Good. What's the title? Encounters with the Honey Island Swamp Monster. Okay. All right. You have to watch it. One of the things I kept watching, and like, um, 
I don't know, remember the guy's name that did the cast, and he was washing it off in the water. And I was like, get your hands out of that water. <laughs> oh, that was I'm, my I live ex. way too far north. <laughs> I, that was, I was married to him at the time. And <laughs> actually, no, I wasn't married to him. I was, we got married after that. <laughs> <laughs> now we're divorced but anyway no he was um, you should have pushed him in huh <laughs> you should have pushed him yeah. in <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah he he took me in a boat a few times to interview he knew a lot of the people on the river someone's knocking at my door <laughs> can i go oh, no. grab that sure oh, sorry Oh, sorry about that. I need to hang a You're sign fine. on the door that says film <laughs> flashing lights <laughs> like they do in Hollywood. Do not disturb. I have my husband sitting outside my door like, don't bother her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, you came back to Louisiana. What what made you decide to come back home? I was homesick for my family. It was hard to be away from everyone uh, for so long. And I I just, they, you know, they say most people that leave Louisiana come back. And it's true. Everybody I ever knew that ventured off from here usually will come back home. Uh, it's just something about being on the bayou and the river. And I, I like I, it. I, you know, some people may not be their cup of tea. <laughs> but my, I miss my family. And so... One day I just got, packed my car up and drove all the way here from California, praying, please let me get there safely. And right as I got <laughs> into the neighborhood, my tire wheelbarrow or something fell off. <laughs> but at least I got here. You know? wow. And it was quite an adventure to go through the desert and everything. You know, it was me and my, it was a roommate at the time and she volunteered to ride with me. And so we got back. I understand how that is about the bayou. I actually uh, grew up on the Mississippi River, way far north of there, way far north. And now I live in middle Tennessee. Huh? And we have a couple of rivers here, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. It's really not. And I miss it. I really miss it. The one thing I do when I go home is my husband takes me down to the river, and I just walk along the river because I, I need that connection. There's something... I guess I have river water in my blood. I don't know. I'm trying I totally right understand. Now to get build a houseboat to so I could spend more. I when we grew, I grew up. We had a houseboat out there, and my dad still has a river camp. And but I, I my plan, I bought star. I got some styrofoam, like long piece of styrofoam. I'm gonna get my son to help me build a little houseboat that we could go out there and spend a lot of time. And I might even have it like where I'll do some filming there, like sort of like this. I'll a podcast or something that I could have guests come to the houseboat, take a little swamp tour, a nighttime oh, swamp cool. tour, investigate and for the honey on the swamp monster, and then go back to the houseboat and have some crawfish or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, your name has become synonymous with the Honey Island Swamp Monster, mm -hmm. but that all started with your grandfather. Yes. Correct, Harlan Ford, Harlan Ford and his friend Billy Mills. Before we get into their encounter, you want to tell me a little bit about your grandfather, who he was, what kind of a man he was? He, Harlan Ford was, uh, he was a, uh, worked for the FAA. He was an uh, air traffic controller. That was his real job. Uh, before that, he went into the service and he learned to fly airplane. He had a little twin engine airplane and he was also a pilot. Uh, and then when he retired later, he was a car, he built houses too. So he did a lot of different things, but he was a big avid outdoorsman. He, every chance he got, it was in the swamp, him and his friend, coworker, Billy Mills. And, um, he would take a lot of the people that worked for him on these camping trips out there. And, um, he was pretty well, he was also a musician. He wrote some really beautiful songs that and recorded them and had other musicians record his music. And so he was, he did a lot of different things. You have an uncle that's a musician too, don't you? I had my uncle, uh, Perry Ford was a musician and, uh, 
his brother, my, those are my mom's brothers, and uh, they they both passed away. David Ford, and they both. Played oh, I'm music. so sorry. And um, a lot of my brother plays music. He plays not in a band. He just uh, on the river. He gets his guitar, and he, then he taught his son to play guitar. So we have come from a, <laughs> a lot of mu- people that are very musical people. That's pretty cool. So, do you want to tell us what um, your grandfather saw in the swamp? Well, he was, um, it was him and Billy were, they had found this area campsite that they wanted to build a camp. And they saw that by, they used to fly over that area of the swamp. And they thought that'll be good hunting territory. And so they built a little, they were building a camp out there. And on one of these trips, they were taking supplies to the camp to the camp where you had to take a boat, get out, drag your boat over, and then you could leave your boat there, but then walk to the camp from there down this trail. It was like a clearing they'd made. And they said uh, on one of these trips in, they came upon this thing that was on all fours down. And, and at first they thought it was like a hog. And uh, when they realized it wasn't a hog, they were like, what is that thing? And it stood up, turned around and faced them. And that's when my grandfather got a good look at his face and, he said it was menacing look. It was like nothing he'd ever seen before. And it's, it's, he said what he remembered most was the eyes, the big amber-colored eyes, um, just looking at him. And he said it was, he went for his gun because he didn't know what it was going to do, but it ran off from him. And, but, you know, for a split second, standing there looking at him, he said the face, it looked almost too human to shoot. If He wouldn't have wanted to shoot it because it looked almost human, but he knew it wasn't human. And it ran off on two feet. And um, that was in 1963. And then in 70, they, 74 is when they actually found the tracks in the same area that, you know, and he assumed because that was the same place that they had seen this creature that that, but that's what made these tracks. And so he called in some friends that worked for the wildlife and fisheries to look at them. And they said they had never seen anything like that. And he, t- he said he took them to LSU zoology, some people he knew there. And, you know, he got a lot of, and then of course the local press found out about it and they did a story about it. And then from there, um, in search of what Leonard Nimoy, uh, inter- came down to interview him and they asked him if he knew anybody else. And he, there was another old, a man that called, they called old man Williams, who was an old trapper that was also in was that, that show. Was that Ted Williams? Yes, Ted Williams. And, um, so then after that, they were on that show and then more people started knowing about this, you know, the Honey Island Swamp Monster <laughs> And they yeah. said it was like my grandmother was. That's like monster mania around here. People came from everywhere wanting to go hunt it down, and they were going to shoot it. And she said, you know, that it just got crazy. And uh, so that was probably why later on, when they we learned that there was the eight millimeter film, and we wondered why he didn't come forth with it. She said because people went crazy back then, because you know that back. It's not like now where a lot of it's more accepted if you talk about Bigfoot or Sasquatch or the Honey Island Swamp Monster. But back then, people, you know, they, they wasn't a whole lot of talk about it. So, But when it did come out locally and then Nash on that TV show, then people come from everywhere just ready to go in the swamp and just look, you know. And, and then my grandfather kind of just, after that, he just, he didn't really do anything like as far as we knew we didn't know he had taken his camera in there and captured that footage till after he was had passed away your grandmother found that footage yeah, she, while she was right in his belongings and she when i was making my documentary she come out she says i don't know if you could use this but you know and then she had a whole box of his films and a lot of them were marked like turkey and deer and alligator and because he was always filming wildlife she said he got more interested in filming that wildlife than really hunting it. um so he uh she had that reel that had honey allen swamp monster written on the with masking tape and she had the old projector there i said can we watch it and we were stunned <laughs> to see what was on that you know None of us knew. Yeah. She's like, I don't know. You know, we were watching it. So in my film, I left it uncut, like just like we saw it, you know, on the wall. We had it up on the white wall in the kitchen. And 
Yeah. Did um, so that footage you, is in the is in the documentary yes. you have out on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I can't. You wait can to also see go that. to her YouTube page. She's got. Uh, you you can watch it on yeah, there. I just that, up. not the documentary. Yeah, but. I put the clip up not too long ago with some music behind it that my uncle had. Well, one of the songs my uncle wrote about the Hunter and Salt Monster, and then another friend wrote another one uh, that's on a different. I don't. I think that's on a different. Uh, more like a promo for the in documentary. What's the name of your channel, Dana? Dana Holyfield. <laughs> on that that particular channel. I haven't got through as many of the videos as I wanted to yet, but I've been enjoying watching the videos on it's your channel. It's got like a, a lot of different genres, not just the Swamp Monster. I got the Swamp Cooking and Cajun Sexy Cooking <laughs> and then Family yeah, Stuff. Yeah, I was... I went, <laughs> I went back today and I realized I hadn't even subscribed. I had to subscribe today. <laughs> so. I do that. When I'm looking at videos, I, I have to tell myself, oh, subscribe, because I'll watch it and I'll forget to do it. And I'm like, that's very important for people. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Leonard Nimoy came down. That's pretty cool. Did I mean, they contacted him. Um, um, I'm not really sure how that happened. I just remember when I was young watching the show and um, later learning who Leonard Nimoy was. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And then there was another film crew out of, um, I think it was England or somewhere they came. They were going to make a, fi a film like a, about, and they went and met with him after his sighting and, you know, they asked him about, it was Eagle Films, about, um, you know, they wanted a copy of the track. So, and, you know, there was a lot of controversy, which I wrote about in my book about someone finding a, a track that had the thing glued on the shoe. And I said, well, um, people like this film company came in town. They want to do reenactments. And my grandfather gave out copies of um, the track. To, you know, I've given out copies of the track to people, so you could take an existing track and glue it on a shoe. But you know, uh, you know, so that was something that happened. And then the person that made that documentary now is a believer in it because he went out and found his own evidence and realized, you know, that there is something out because he found tracks like that since then. More recently, M. K. Davis, and um, he he does a lot of research out. So we, we um, met and he, you know, told me that he's now, he believes there is something because he's found the sticks and, you know, law, he, a hog that with the throats tore out. And, you know, he's found things out there too in that area. And he's even gone to where my grandfather's camp used to be, way out there. So. I'm quite familiar with M.K. Davis. I didn't realize he was the one that was, well, it was um, his partner. arguing. It was him and his partner that they came, they were making their documentary. And while they were here, that's when they discovered um, it was Ricky Holyfield's family with the, they said, we got the boot shoe that proved, or the shoe glued on the track. And so that caused a lot of controversy. And then, so I wanted to go see this shoe thing myself. And so I went and met with him and I'm, He's like, your your grandfather wore them same kind of shoes. I'm like, how would you remember 40 years ago, <laughs> like or 50, <laughs> you know? And his foot was not that. And he had a bigger foot than that, you know. And it was, um, but you know that people. There's always going to be skeptics and people trying, you know, discredit. And um, some people said, and his, I met his son, and one time they told me that they were such big hunters that they didn't want anyone disturbing their hunting territory. So they didn't want people that were going to do research to come look for anything. So they just made it like, oh, it's a big hoax. You know, that was a joke, you know. And was that two brothers? Well, uh, Ricky Holyfield, and I'm not, I know, I'm not really sure. Probably, he probably had brothers. I think he did have a brother that. I remember watching, um, and I don't remember what channel it was on, but I watched a documentary, and there were two gentlemen who were discrediting um, your grandfather based on the fact that they had this shoe with the... That was them. <laughs> and I, I, I remember thinking that they didn't come across as being especially creditable, yeah. but that was me. So, <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I, I'm not discrediting anybody, but it just, they didn't seem to be very impressive. They didn't impress me very much. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with you. I think that a lot of times production companies come out to make, um, and they have to have something to make people watch the show. Mm -hmm. So they're going to make a set of tracks. Yeah. Do a re And so. And I've had a, I've had a yeah. lot of shows that came for, t like they were on the travel channel <clears throat> or whatever. And, and they would want to, you know, the track, you got a track, can we go stick it in the mud and to do a reenactment? And, you know, and I figured that's probably how, if he did actually really find that it wasn't staged from the get go from them, because they didn't want people in their hunt territory. Um, and it, it could have been left by Eagle Films or also by the people who did In Search of, or, you know, or just somebody trying to make it like it's a hoax because they didn't want, you know, anyone. People's funny about that out in the swamp. They don't, they like their prophecy. <laughs> they don't want outsiders yeah. coming. You know, a lot of those people out there, they didn't want people tromping through their hunting territory and fishing territory. I understand that. Did, um, is, I'm curious, is that the catalyst? What made you decide to do your documentary was? Um, I think because what made, I think what made me do that particular because, you know, I, when I was in L.A., I didn't really think of it being like, I didn't know it was going to, that people were that interested as far like they are. I mean, I didn't realize there was that much interest in it till I came back here and um, just meeting people that said, oh, your grandfather, I had, I saw that thing. I saw what he saw. And then, you know, and they tell me their story. And then I thought, huh, you know, and I, so I started filming. I got my little camera and then I thought, well, maybe with a, enough eyewitnesses and just telling his story. And so I, tr I put it together and I realized, you know, that people were very interested in. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. The legend of Honey on the Swamp Monster, so. That was when I first made the documentary. That's what I called it. it was the legend of the honey on swamp monster. And then when I revised it, I changed the name. I don't know why I did that, but, but I changed it to encounters with the honey on swamp monster. And, uh, and I plan to do a, a, like a new one, you know, in the future that where I actually go in and I'll be, have the camera crew where I take people and we're going to camp out overnight and, you know, see what happens while we're investigating the area and spend the night out there and see what, maybe it'll come out again. <laughs> Scare me half to death. He's <laughs> like, you want to meet me? Okay. <laughs> Have you ever actually had a sighting? Well, I've never seen it, but I've heard, I've heard things out there and I've seen track. We found tracks. Um, when I did a, when I was, Years ago, married to someone that's on Swamp People, Terrell Evans. That's who was washing the track off in my film. They wanted us to go on a camping trip to, to look for the Honey on the Swamp Monster as one of the episodes. So he said, like, yeah, my wife, she'll do it. You know, we'll go out there. And, and we decided it was like last minute, went had someone drop us off and we took some friends with two friends with us and I was a lady and her son and the two camera guys. And we, tr we were way out there. They dropped us and they, and we just started walking. It was getting dark and we had our, the tents and stuff. And then we didn't have a lot of time to make camp. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, okay, we're out here in the middle of this, this area where there's been several sightings and um, we got the tents up, and uh, we put a motion camera in the tree. And then during the, you know, we sat around, something threw a, like, it was like something threw sticks towards us. And at first I thought it was like a squirrel. And then we was looking around, and another stick come, and then we could hear something like it was beaten on a tree. And I, and I thought, you know, surely no one's out here trying to prank us you know nobody really knew we were going you know to that area and um <clears throat> so we did our little scene where we were you know for that the show and then 
camera guys went in their tent and I went and we went in our tent and the, my friend went in her tent with her son. And all of a sudden later on the night, I could hear something walking in the area. And it didn't sound like it was a hog running around or some kind of animal. It sounded like something walking. And I'm thinking, here we are in this little thin tent and this thing that my grandfather said was so big and ferocious and all these other people. I said, oh, my gosh, what if it really decides it's going to, you know, it could get us right now. And But so I was like, go see what that is. And, you know, of course, and you know, he went out and looked around, come back. Oh, it's just a rabbit. And I'm like, but when we went back the next morning, as soon as daylight, I never slept a wink. I just sat there and I, at the top of the tent had a screen. So I would get up and I would look around and, you know, the fire <laughs> was kind of going out. And I thought as soon as daylight comes, we're getting out of here. And, um, <laughs> and sure enough, and then those camera guys, the two camera guys that came with us, I don't, they filmed a lot for swamp people out on the river, but they hadn't really been like, where we took them, and I think they really got scared too. They were kind of like, you know, they got uneasy as a, as you know, think especially when something was throwing sticks at us. And um, anyway, so the next morning when we went, we left out there at daylight and got back to camp. And in the the we took the motion camera, and in the picture on one of the pictures, it, it was like this. You could see in the corner a hairy thing, like it something might have leaned over and you caught just the edge of it before that it snapped the picture. But I thought, well, it might have been curious what that was and leaned over because the cameras were, you know, they weren't low to the ground. They were kind of high up. Yeah. So That's pretty and I, cool. And I, had, I had another, uh, when I first came back from uh, California <laughs> and I had some of my friends, we went out to their camp and the guys decided they were going to leave us to go run lines and and, it was, and they got the fire going and we're me and the two girls were sitting around the fire and and we ha- heard some stuff going on out in those woods and we got really spooked and went in the camp and uh, left the fire <laughs> and we it's like and then something hit the side of the camp and we were screaming oh my God. and then I thought you know if I and I remembered my grandfather's story. This was before I did the, my film and the book. And I just, that kind of made me also want to write this because of my experience, that feeling of being so vulnerable out there in the middle of the swamp and something like that could come up on you. And what would you do? And um, and then knowing that other people had actually come face to face with this. And I thought, what would I do if I actually came face to face with it, you know, and so I've always gone out there, always, you know, I always took my camera hoping I would come across it face to face or, but not too close <laughs> But to at least get a, you know, get it on film would be cool, but I have to spend a hundred yards more time. with a good head running start mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that you, you know, can get away. Yeah. I'd be okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Dana, I'm from Memphis. I was raised on the river, too. Oh, were you? And the only thing I'm afraid of in those swamps is the cotton mouth. Oh, yeah, we get a lot of those. And big, <laughs> hairy spiders. I don't like those big wood, wood. The spiders don't bother me. It's that old cold jaw laying yeah, up on that log, Yeah, those, son, those when you're going under and you're afraid they got in the big wasp nests that are like this big. And you oh, yeah. a thousand yeah. wasps on them. And if you're, at, if you're going in there running lines and you happen to bump it, one of those things, you better jump in the river. Or the hornets yeah. are bad, too. So. But, yeah, yeah. cottonmouths are bad. and um, But those spiders, I, I'd probably jump out of the boat. If a spider jumped in the boat, that the big, they're like this big, like tarantulas. <laughs> and they have hair, and you can see their eyes. And so, yeah, those are kind of scary. No, 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 no. There's no such thing as a spider any smaller than this big in my book. <laughs> All spiders are about like this. Mm-mm. No, I'm not good with spiders. I'll fight a cottonmouth any day of the week, not a spider. Mm-mm. You you can fight a cottonmouth all you want. I don't want anything to do with them. I've been chased by a cottonmouth before. <laughs> I was, we used to swim off our houseboat and... um 
it was coming across towards us because they chase you. They, they're not afraid like a lot of other snakes will go the other way. Right. The cotton off, it was coming, and my dad shot at it. Uh, he probably shot, you know, and told us, get out of the river. <laughs> but so, <laughs> yeah. You know, I was kicked out of a uh, a Facebook page about river water snakes. Really? Because I said that uh, cottonmouths are aggressive. And the people who ran it, <laughs> they didn't want to hear any of that. And they kicked me out. Oh, no. And then they, and my son was in it too. And he goes, it's because you said to, co-, because I've had them come after me. Like we'll be brim fishing out, mm-hmm. you know, in the oxbows north of you, but it's still the same kind of water. And they'll be curled up on the log. You get close to them, they slide off in that water. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, they're that big around yeah. and black as coal. Mm-hmm. And they're only about that long. And uh, they'll slide off in that water and they'll pop up. Uh, we've had them come over the transom of the boat. We've had them bite baits and stuff like that. They do get aggressive. They are. I don't care what people say. But I got kicked out of a Facebook page for saying that. Oh, no. <laughs> Guess they thought I was doing disinformation <laughs> yeah, or fake news or something. Conspiracy <laughs> <theorists>. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry to hijack you there, Neoma. I didn't No, know you're fine. Um, right. I yeah. actually have had the opposite. I've been right up against one with my boot and couldn't get it to strike. Really? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it, you know, I guess it's the time of day or the area or the time of year or something, but... They come I, in our yard. I've been chased by a lot of snakes. I've got copperheads in my yard that drive me kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, but I usually run a little bit and turn around and jump back at them, and it scares them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, those I are don't know. scary because they blend in so much with the tree barks, and mm-hmm. we get those around here too. Yeah, they. I usually don't see one unless it's a baby with a little yellow tail. They tend to stick out a little bit, but I usually don't see them until they're right on top. You know, I'm about to step on it. Simon's blind as a bat. But um, I, I lived in Lexington, Kentucky for a while. And <clears throat> after this, I'll shut up, Naomi. No, I, I have to tell going. the story because Dana will appreciate it. Uh, so there was a snake show going on at Rupp Arena. And myself and a couple of men in the neighborhood, our wives were out doing something. We said, hey, let's take the kids to the snake exhibit at the <laughs> Rupp Arena. Okay, let's do it. We'll go get burgers and beer and then we'll go get take them to see the snakes. And I told them walking in, I said, you're probably going to see a cobra. You're going to see rattlesnakes. You're going to see all kind of venomous snakes. But the meanest snake in there is going to be that cottonmouth. You mark my words. Oh, they're not as mean as a copperhead or a rattlesnake. <laughs> I said, okay. So we go by the cobra. The cobra's just laying there. Rattle Two or three rattlesnakes, different you know varieties uh- of rattlesnakes. We get to the cottonmouth thing, and that thing's all coiled back, <laughs> and that whole glass is just looks like blurry because it's keep it just keeps hitting that glass, hitting that glass. <laughs> it was killing itself trying to get at people, you know. It, it's being defensive. It's what it's doing. Yeah, that's what makes them so mean. They're extra defensive, and that <laughs> one of the guys says that is the damn meanest snake I have ever seen in my life. I said, I told you, man, they're mean. They are. A friend of ours had he'd have a lot of they'd have a lot of parties over there and they in their bathroom there's a fish tank it was an outdoor bathroom uh the real rustic kind of environment and there's a cotton mouth in there pet cotton mouth. well he ain't pet it's not a pet but <laughs> i happen to look over and it's like looking at me and i'm like oh no 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 <laughs> so then they, <laughs> so then they're like you know, they had a lot of kids around the party who became interested in this cottonmouth, so he had to go move the whole tank out of there because he was afraid one of the kids would take the top off to play with the snake. And yeah, was, yeah. Like, Neoma, really you're back. <laughs> I'm back. My internet went out. We so can't we'll hear see you. Just how- oh. Hmm. Ah, there you are. See the okay. My internet went out, so we'll see how uh, good Riverside is at recovering that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it kept well, going. So- we kept talking, and we've been talking about <laughs> snakes, and 
I, I figured you had dropped out. I was just going to carry on the interview, but you, you good for you. Now the ball's <laughs> back in your court. Mm. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, Dana, we were doing an interview and Cameron had a tornado come over his house and I got stuck be- <laughs> being the uh, one. So I was just getting even. <laughs> yeah. Did the tornado hit your house? It came right behind us, and it re- tore the roof off the hospital down, down uh, to ta- downtown, and uh, just kept on going northeast. And but it knocked our power out ten minutes into the live stream, and I thought it was over, but they just kept talking. So Neoma did the whole live stream for me. They've had, they've had some tornadoes. <laughs> yeah, I managed to recently, keep recently, which is odd, you know, to do as much damage as some of these tornadoes did. Yeah. Yeah, big cities are getting hit, and that's really unheard of. Yeah. It's always trailer parks, you know. That's because they're messing and with our... our <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a whole nother show. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dana, you're not just... Um, you're not just Honey Island Swamp Monster. You are an author, um, which... Uh, I already showed, held up one of your books, and um, I have to look at my notes real quick. Hang on, and I want to hear about the Bayou written. Mermaid. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the ki- No, the children's book. Yeah, I was going to talk about the cookbooks, but we'll do the children's oh, book okay. first. I love that. I'm sorry. I have. A, You're fine. I have the. Li- it's the Little Bayou Mermaid, um, and it's written in verse for little ki- the little kids, and I. Uh, h- hired a artist from, he was actually from the Ukraine, Pavel Gorn, and uh, he illustrated it like two years ago, and um, and I self-published it on Amazon, and it's about a little mermaid that learned that she gets tangled in a fish net, and then the little boy fisherman finds her, and they become friends. He untangles her net, and then he teaches her how to read. Like, he reads books to her, and he's fixing to go away to college, and and uh, he says he's going to come back, when, you know, after he goes through college, but he had to go away, and then he never comes back. So she uses the books, like all her knowledge that she learns in the books he read her to find him. And then she discovers why, you know, that he'd had an accident and he, he lost his memory, so he didn't know. So then she, in the very end of the book, he gets his memory, he remembers her. And then, so. <laughs> That's a great That's idea cool. for a book. How's the book done on well, Amazon? Pretty good? Not, a lot of people don't really know about I guess I haven't promoted it and advertised on Amazon like I should, you know, like to try to get people to know about it. Um, so I, I wish it would do better. <laughs> so like, I guess- hey, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm. is it on, uh, so you'd need to get the soft cover, a Kindle version. There's you Kindle wouldn't get the full effect. They have you? Kindle and uh, paperback. <clears throat> Oh, no. Yeah, I'll promote it on my channel. Okay, thank you. And I'm definitely going to promote it here, but of course, we're not nearly as big as Cam, so you'll get a lot more business out of that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that I thought that was really cool how teaching her to read made him decide he wanted to a be teacher. a teacher. Yeah, I thought that was a really neat thing. That's I a enjoyed great that one. story. It's a great idea for a story. And I, I tried I to yeah. recently uh, get in touch with the artist who illustrated it because he lived in Ukraine. And so I managed to uh, get in touch with him once. And he said at that point that the war had just started. And he said, I'm without my pen, but now with the gun in my hands, protecting my family. Oh, wow. So, and I haven't heard from him since. So and I've... Uh, how did you connect with a man from Ukraine <laughs> to Upwork, do your artwork? On Upwork site, well, you, I was looking for an artist to illustrate the book, and um, he sent me some of his pictures, and and so that's how I found him. You know, and I'm going to write that down. Upwork. I've sent you the link to that before, Cam. I'm sure I have. Uh, uh, you probably have. Um, yeah. Cam has a, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but he has this series called Steve Lilly. 
and everybody's just crazy about it. And I think it needs to be made into a graphic novel. I think it would go over really well as a graphic novel. I think it'd be a fun Netflix series, but <clears throat> what do I, I know? I think it would be, you know? too. Yeah, it's really, if you ever get a chance, you have to listen to at least a couple of his Steve Lilly stories. They are fantastic. Dana, when we're done here, let's exchange email addresses, and I'll send you a link. Okay, and cool. Thanks. Since you're from Hollywood, you can tell me what you think. I'd be <laughs> curious to know what you think about okay, it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Love to um, well, I also wanted to talk about your cookbooks. Yeah. Um, is that anything to do with the Gator's Breath ca Cafe? <laughs> well, I have, uh, I f did the Swamp Cooking with the River People cookbook first. That's what I, when I first came back from California, uh, I had wrote the book actually when I was in California, right before I moved, um, uh, and when I got here, I went ahead and self-published the self-published it the first time, and then about I've been here like about four months, and I get a call from uh, people in L.A. My friend, and he said Ten Speed Press was looking for you know to contact me about my book because I'd sent it to them because they did a book called White Trash Cooking, which was a big you know had like funny stories and picture, lots of pictures like my books. And so I chose to send it to them and they decided they wanted to publish it. So they published it first. And then um, they did the sequel, which was more swamp cooking. And that was in 98. So since then I took it back over and started, uh, I did the swamp cooking with the river people, revised a little bit and um, just self published it. And, and then I did Cajun Sexy Cooking, which was girls out there hunting and fishing in the swamp, uh, wearing bikinis. And <laughs> that was probably one of my better selling books. But only like local, like <laughs> I used to take them to the French Quarter gift shops and all those, and, the, and some of the stores along the interstate to the gas, like the gas stations. And they'd let me put them on the counter. And that book would sell out every time um, I would uh, put it out there. But. Uh, I still have that one on Amazon. I've revised it, a, you know, several times. And I've written, uh, I did one called Louis the Swamp Country, Louisiana Swamp Country Cooking, which is like Swamp, the first Swamp Cooking, but all new pictures and store, more stories in it about life in the swamp. Um, let's see. <laughs> the Gator's Breath Cafe, that, it's kind of, it's a, like a romantic comedy love story, like a short novel sort of, but and I was going to add recipes. So I did two versions to try to test mm -hmm. it to see what would work best. And I did it as a cookbook with a, a storybook cookbook. But I don't think people really got that. Like, oh, is it a cookbook or is it a novel? So, I, you know, so then I took it down and just put it out recently as a not a short novel just to, see what would happen but it's um that one's kind of a little bit based on a little reality because when i was in la modeling and then i came back and i ended up marrying someone who hunted alligators <laughs> and it's, so it's based on a little <laughs> bit of some of the truth but not you know not completely it's a lot of fiction there but but um they say write what you know so, <laughs> so yeah so so you're saying if I come down there, I can't go to the Gator's Breath Cafe and get some gator meat? Huh? No, no, you know, it's <laughs> funny because um, with the Cajun Sexy Cooking, I had so many producers from L.A. wanting to come here and set up a reality show based on that concept. But nothing ever got off the ground. And what they would say is, we need to come down and do a sizzle reel. And then they'd say they'd get busy with some big production. And they'd say, OK, you you do a sizzle reel. And then we'll see, you know, so I did the sizzle, you know, with my little camera back then and trying to do do that myself. And that's how a lot of those videos on YouTube that I have for Cajun Sexy Cooking, I, you know, I made those trying to make the sizzle reel and the, to try to set up a TV show. And and then the producer said, um, we, you know, we do it like it's a restaurant where the, the girls are hunting fish what they're going to, the catch of the day, and y'all going to cook it for the people who come eat at the restaurant. So they set me up with a meeting with, I think it was Hearst Entertainment, and they're like, 
after talking to her, yeah, we really like this, but it needs to be a real restaurant. I said, well, that's no problem. I mean, we got, if you want it to be a real restaurant, that's not a problem. Everything on reality TV stage pretty much anyway. And so we'll just set it up and and make it a restaurant. People come there, that, that won't be a problem. But they really wanted it to be a restaurant. So, and it wasn't at the time. So they said, well, if you ever get it as a real restaurant, then give us a call. And then maybe we'll do something if it's a real existing place, I guess, because, you know, they want it to be real. But So that's how Gators, the top, the name Gators Breath Cafe came, you know, because we were going to call that show <laughs> that. I love that little promo. I guess it was a sizzle reel you were yeah. making then. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. That just it cracked me up. The girls were fighting out in the driveway. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, people yelling. He them. kicked the guy out for rolling around. Yeah, in the getting dirt. a little handy with the girls. <laughs> I'm having a I beat love on that. I thought it was great. Girls, get back to work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think it would have probably been a good was... little. You know, like a little people would have watched that. I think you know, with all those yeah girls hunting and fishing and bringing bringing in the. The uh, the meal of the day and having cooking it up could have a lot of Catching different the stories frog. and characters there. But so maybe who knows? Maybe one day they'll want to do that. Maybe they'll bite. I'd watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Thanks. Got to check my notes again here. Make sure I got everything covered. Um, well, I think we did pretty good tonight. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add, Cam? Oh, uh, no. No, I just, <clears throat> I remember I was looking at your YouTube channel while y'all were talking, and you've got tons of really good videos. I can't wait to go through them. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> if, the, if you don't mind, I'd love to talk about some of your books and stuff on my channel. I don't want to do it without your blessing oh, but um you have my blessing <laughs> i love that okay thank you and uh and then we'll uh i don't know i might generate you know you might sell 10 or 12 books or something like that i don't know you never know i i narrate audio books and i thought well this i got into something where there's some money there's no money in audio books either so i've done about <laughs> a, a dozen of them mm-hmm. and you there's just no money in any of it on that gate unless you yeah Unless you uh, narrate a bestseller like right. a Stephen King or a Charles Frazier or somebody like that, John Sanford. Um, but most people who are publishing on Amazon are just nobodies like me. We're just trying to sell books and audio books and things. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's very competitive now. And there's so many people into it that you've got to have a – you've got to have a – a break. There's got to be some kind of break to kind of set you up on top and get the the masses interested in whatever the topic is. Mm-hmm. So it's tough, but it's fun to do. It is a lot of fun. Yeah, I do it more because I feel like I just have to write, or do, you know, if I'm not writing something, you know, whether it ever makes any money or not, I, it's like it's my. People just say, oh, you're just a dreamer. You know, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like, I have to do this. I have to. I'm not like the the screenplays is what I love to do. And um, yeah. sit and write the script, the scripts, movie scripts. And so that's my true passion. But so. Well, I have to be honest with you. I've written eight complete novels and I haven't published one. So I know you're, you're, I feel your pain. I, and those will probably never be published at this point. I've got three more that I'm trying to finish right now, but, um, it's something you can't help. If you're compelled to do it, it, it burns a hole in you till you get it out. So I understand that. Did you have any closing comments you wanted to make Dana? Just that I enjoyed talking with y'all and appreciate you having me on your show. Cool. Well, we're certainly glad that you came. So I guess, folks, that that pretty much wraps it up for us tonight. Thank for thank you for stopping by. Thank you, Cam, for being here and being my Ed McMahon tonight. And thank <laughs> you especially to Dana for being our guest. And thank you, folks, for stopping by and I'm Neoma Finn, and I hope you come back again soon.